Check, check. One, two, three. It's party time, motherfuckers! The last video covered Shadows of the Damned, a third-person shooter that started as a potentially genius horror project mutated into a horror story for the developers, mangled by the hands of EA before thrown in the river without even so much as a mere life preserver in the form of a magazine ad. Travis, hello? Enough of this negativity. Our next game was not only heavily supported by multiple publishers, but it's also much brighter and more colorful. Let's cheer up with Lollipop Chainsaw. The beginning of development can be traced to around 2009. Suda51 was coming up with ideas after finishing up development of Fatal Frame 4 with game company Tecmo. We needed to create a character capable of fighting with at least one weapon, but which one? I wanted to avoid guns since too many games feature guns. Same thing with swords. Finally, I came up with the idea of a chainsaw. No doubt Suda was definitely tired of guns at the time while salvaging what he could with Shadows of the Damned. He drew up some concept work and even created a small build of the game. During this time, he was in talks with Tecmo to publish. Suda figured that since he just finished co-developing a horror game specifically for a Japanese audience, it's time to try making something more horror-esque for an international audience in order to continue his journey to the West. Unfortunately, things took a turn for the worse just before the game was going to officially begin production. We decided amongst ourselves that Lollipop Chainsaw would be realized through a partnership with Tecmo, so we began preparing initial production. Just a few weeks before concrete development began, Tecmo merged with Koei to form Koei Tecmo. Soon after, following numerous changes to staff and editorial, we were told that such a project would no longer be possible. Thus, it was dead in the water. I guess his concept of a cheerleader with a chainsaw against an army of zombies wasn't palatable for the newly formed Koei Tecmo and their obsession with Muso junk. Later on, he would meet Yoshimi Yasuda, a former Tecmo employee who worked alongside him on Fatal Frame 4. He just became head of a new games division for Kadokawa and wanted to meet up with Suda in order to discuss new ideas for a game. He loved the idea of Lollipop Chainsaw and wanted in on the project. While Kadokawa Games can publish it no problem in Japan, Suda needed further support for an overseas release. The two would have meetings with representatives of Western publishers in order to gain interest. Suda claims the people who attended these presentations loved the concept, but one had to put their money where their laughing mouth was. That company would end up being WB Games, a fairly fresh publishing company gaining recognition just as they were drumming up accolade with the new Batman Arkham games, Bastion, and Mortal Kombat 9. With that, Lollipop Chainsaw was saved. The game was revealed in July of 2011. Our heroine is Juliet Starling, high school cheerleader and professional zombie hunter, armed with her dazzling moves and oversized chainsaw. Using her trusty means to kill, she has to take on hordes among hordes of zombies that have spread about the town. With Suda51 serving as creative director, the writing would be handled by Masahiro Yuki, who was part of Fatal Frame 4's development, as well as James Gunn. That's right, a Hollywood hotshot known for his involvement in Dawn of the Dead 2004, the first two live-action Scooby-Doo films, and later on, Guardians of the Galaxy. This would be his first attempt at a video game. Akira Yamaoka, continuing to get snugly in the head sound director seat at Grasshopper, creates original tunes for the majority of the game. While he's best known for Silent Hill's ambient, atmospheric scores, I knew he would do a great job working on a more intense action game. After all, he was the main composer for Contra Shattered Soldier, which has one of the most exhilarating scores I've ever heard in my life. The boss themes are all composed by James Uringer, better known as Jimmy Urin, famous for being the lead singer of Mindless Self-Indulgence. Further adding to the plethora of high-end hires, well, higher ends than what Grasshopper is used to, the game also sports an array of actors, some that are more known for live-action roles. For Juliet herself, we have Tara Strong, famous for voicing... fucking too much. She's actually in a decent chunk of Suda's games as it is. Michael Rosenbaum as Nick, who's best known for betraying Lex Luthor in Smallville. Linda Cardellini, the love of my life, as Cordelia. She was Lindsay in Freaks and Geeks, as well as Velma in the first two live-action Scooby-Doo films. Kimberly Brooks as Rosalind. Hey, she voices Shinobu in No More Heroes. Michael Rooker as Vic best known for his role as Merle in Walking Dead, and Yondu in Guardians of the Galaxy. And Shawnee Smith as Mariska, best known for her roles as Amanda Young in the Saw franchise. This cast, on top of getting Gun and Urine on the project, was pretty surprising for a Grasshopper game. Obviously not all huge superstars, but some pretty renowned actors, and most of them typically lack video games in their portfolio. 
I'm sure WB was able to provide plenty of these hookups. Suda even goes on the record saying that the gun collaboration happened through WB. Warner Bros wanted someone who was good with zombies, and they suggested James Gunn, but he's a Hollywood celebrity, so I thought, maybe he's going to be a figurehead only. But when the project started, he got very much involved and rewrote the whole thing from Japanese to English. And he also did the casting for voice actors in English. So he wasn't just a name. He made the project his own. You're already dead! This could be alarming for some Suda fans. Just how much involvement did he have in this game? Does it still focus on the aspects of individualism, society, and death? You'll just have to wait and see. Lollipop Chainsaw started as a fun little project Suda was just showing around, seeing if it was something worth pursuing, if people would be interested. He saw this as nothing more than an experimental side piece, which, beyond his control, inflated into a massive retail game. We started development around 2009. James Gunn joined as a scenario writer. The scale of the project turned out much bigger than we expected. We thought we could take it easy with an experimental horror game. Uh-oh, does this sound a bit too familiar? Now hold your horses, this isn't Shadows of the Damned all over again. Suda and his gang remain in control from beginning to end with how the game turned out overall. The earliest stages of production involved it being a goofy cheerleader action horror game, and it comes out as just that in the end. When he's describing it as a horror game, I think it's more akin to the likes of The Devil May Cry. It bears essence and atmosphere related to horror, but it isn't inherently scary. Regardless that Suda let other heads take over as director and writers, he provided heavy input with game design and creating the characters. He has also expressed how electric the air was while in this process. Everyone just had to bring in their input on Juliet, especially when it came to her more risque costumes. All the characters are like your own children. Her shell bikini costume as an in-game purchase item felt, well, a bit like my own daughter being stripped naked, so I felt a bit uneasy. Huh. That's funny. He didn't seem to mind Paula tits out in Shadows of the Damned. This might speak for how weak his love is for that game at the time compared to other projects. Now, for a lot of people when it comes to Lollipop Chainsaw even being mentioned, what's the first thing that may come to mind? Yep, Jessica Negri. Hang on, is that Jessica Negri? Oh, wait, yeah it is. In early 2012, even IGN got involved in the marketing by hosting a public ballot in which the winner would portray Juliet Starling in a promotional campaign. Trailers, expo appearances, the works. Among the nominees, Jessica Negri was the most popular entry due to the notoriety she already had as a traveling cosplayer. Jessica would become the real-life Juliet Starling, make tons of appearances to market the game and get kicked out of conventions for doing her job. Getting a famous cosplayer's involvement is one of the many ways WB and Kadokawa were supporting the game. There was also plenty of commercials, online ads, pre-order bonuses, and crossover content. I was actually working at a GameStop when Lollipop Chainsaw launched and they even sent out these big marketing boxes with goodies inside to help promote the game. It is by far the most heavily advertised Grasshopper title to date. Quite the paradigm shift after EA outright ignored the existence of Shadows of the Damned as it was heading towards its release date. Finally, Suda and his team were getting the attention they deserved. This is all well and good, but why is Lollipop Chainsaw designed to look like this, one might wonder. What's with the kid sticker set vomited all over this bloody zombie slaying adventure? A fun, happy zombie game has yet to exist. Lollipop Chainsaw is the only zombie game that has hearts and rainbows. It is a game that you can enjoy with popcorn. Gritty, realistic zombie games already exist, so there's no need for us to make them. Rainbows are scattered everywhere in Lollipop Chainsaw to highlight the fact that this is a fun but offbeat game. Yeah, nothing like it. What, you like Bikini Zombo Slayers? Fuck that noise. I love the mentality he has when it comes to game development. Why bother creating something that many others already have? Always strive to be unique and fresh. But even then, why a cheerleader is our main protagonist? Why not the more typical gruff man armed with a chainsaw? I thought a tough male protagonist killing zombies with a chainsaw would be too similar to Ash from Army of Darkness. And then suddenly the idea of a cheerleader came to me. Cheerleaders can do athletic moves and high kicks, and they have upper body strength. They're tough. Well, if Suda is anything, he's unconventional. He's not one to conform, so this game is already shouting his let's punk philosophy. Keep in mind, this is when Brown and Gloom was still the hot ticket item for its generation. Not only that, but he also noticed the current weather of video game protagonists. He figured it was high time to mix things up from what people were used to. I wanted to give birth to a video game heroine who supersedes past female video game characters. So here, Juliet makes her debut. As you will soon see, Juliet is not exactly your typical female video game character in all ways. 
With the help of Gunn's writing, she is less of a symbol for strong feminism that usually comes with the baggage of lacking any interesting traits, and more of a relatable character with her own weaknesses, while still being a charming heroine full of personality. I think this is something some Japanese developers are good at, but with the combined powers of the East and West will bring us a female rep that shines brightly most of the time. Don't hate me! So how's the gameplay? I suppose you can call it a hack and slash, but it's not nearly as smooth as your Devil May Cry's or Bayonetta's. Hell, it might not even be as slick as your God of Wars. Gods of Wars? Gods of War? Just look at No More Heroes, his first attempt at a hack and slash. The game feels stiff, sort of like No More Heroes, but loosens up a bit once you earn new moves from the shop that you come across throughout each stage. The core gameplay is, wouldn't you know it, hacking up zombos with your killer cheerleading techniques, gigantic chainsaw, two-handed cannon, and of course, wrestling moves. It's all as simple and straightforward as, well, the name of the game. Killing multiple zombies in quick succession also grants you a dazzling finish, superficially similar to the main mechanic from Shinobi on PS2, and also reminds me of grabbing grapes in Metal Gear Rising, only more tedious. Okay, I get it. Yep. Got three again this time. I know. Okay. Alright, goddammit, I get it! The gameplay mixes things up here and there with minigames and using Nick's decapitated head for assistance, but the majority of this adventure is about slaying the shit talking undead. I'll rip out your taint! They typically just make strange statements. <laughs> or say something perverted towards Juliet. At least I can look up your skirt as I die. There's also NPC survivors that you have to rescue, in which a lot of them express their gratitude. Thanks, Juliet. Totally gonna friend request you tonight. Or just say something perverted towards Juliet. I never thought I'd be saved by someone with such great tits. That's pretty much the gameplay. As for the story, Juliet Starling is a high school cheerleader who just turned 18, so your thoughts aren't too weird. Brought up by a family of zombie hunters. Apparently in this world, there's enough of them to make it a business, even before this outbreak. Although it's worth noting, zombies weren't the only otherworldly creatures she and her family hunted. Zombies, vampires, Sasquatches. You killed a Sasquatch? Sure, tons. Sasquatches are dicks. But what else have you killed? Leprechauns. I killed a whole tribe of Frankenberries once. Frankenberry? From like the cereal? Ugh, that is total propaganda to get you to trust them. Hmm. Huh. Throwaway gag or a sequel? We may never know. It starts out as any other school day at first. Juliet! Boyfriend gets infected, but Juliet manages to save his life. I love you too, baby. I performed a, a magical ritual on your head. It was really hard, and I don't mean to be a jerk, but I think maybe just a little bit of appreciation is in order. If I didn't chop off your head, the venom would have totally seeped into your brain and turned you into a zombie. Juliet, how? How do you know how to perform a magical ritual on my decapitated head? I'm a zombie hunter. Confronting Swan, a complete outcast and master of black magic who summoned this demonic disease onto the town in the first place calls forth the Dark Purveyors. You're the one who called us here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm your new master. And I demand you initiate the pawn into the ritual and rot every living thing in the school along the way! <laughs> Past the prologue, every stage has its own dark purveyor and each represent a subgenre of rock music. Throughout your Zombini hunting adventure, you learn more about Juliet, her family, and relationship with Nick. What's your favorite color, Nick? Blue. No, green. Awesome. I love learning about you. I fucked up. It's yellow. Charming and not so charming banter that adds more to their personalities. Very similar to Garcia and Johnson in Shadows of the Damned, except Johnson was a clever little skull with an intriguing background, having witty banter with the thick headed Garcia. This demon's an absolute lunatic! Don't be so down on the guy. Maybe his mother forgot to hug him. Or he played too many video games. <laughs> Yes, well, there's still a bit of a leap between socially maladjusted and Dear Abby, I just ingested my own heart! Besides the odd lines here and there, Nick exchanged a memorable personality for skin. 
Basketball? Why basketball? Just don't throw my head into the hoop. That is everything Lollipop Chainsaw had to offer, and I was a little surprised. The campaign felt fairly short, and the gameplay was definitely choppy. As discussed previously, Grasshopper had plenty of trouble working with the Unreal Engine while making Shadows of the Dam, but stuck with it for the rest of the company's career so far. Ah, we're falling! Ugh, I got us! Yay! This game saw little improvement in regards to functionality, and there were certainly some noticeable blemishes as well as weird glitches. What? Excuse me? Why is there a T posing Juliet over there? Why is there a T posing Juliet over there? What? Uh, I didn't mean to hit that during. What? <laughs> the zombies also tend to feel, for lack of a better term, blocky. The hitboxes and collision detection just don't seem right. On top of that, the game itself is still pretty repetitive. I can't deny it probably has the same level of monotony as No More Heroes, and everyone loves that game, right? While I'll immediately say the gameplay is not very fluid and can feel tedious, I actually enjoyed the rough, jaggedy feel to it. I love playing hack and slash classics in which their characters use slick style, grace, and precision to build their combos with buttery smooth moves and various weapons. Juliet, however, uses a giant chainsaw, probably the ultimate juxtaposition of a cheerleader. Did people really expect her to have the same kind of style as Bayonetta? I think the developers intended for the game to feel this way in order for the hack and slash gameplay to have a much bigger emphasis on the hacking. It's heavy, it's meaty, it's as savage as an oversized chainsaw should be. It reminds me a lot of how Mad World feels, for obvious reasons. They attempt to break up the monotony with a handful of unique scenarios, but even some of those overstayed their welcome. Chop up a hundred zombies with a giant mower, sure. Do the exact same thing again minutes later, but now it's 300 zombies. Why? Shut up, grass! What really kept me going about the adventure was the world and its characters. I adored how everything looked. It was more than just colorful. It has this motif that's charming and depraved at the same time. I think this appearance of the game was due to Nico Shogun's involvement, who would provide a heavy hand in designing many of the characters and enemies. But what is a character without good writing? It was a delight hearing what everyone had to say, including the enemies. It's nearly 9 o'clock. You should go home. Don't get me wrong, they're not all home runs, but the appeal just came from how everyone reacted to the situations. You know what, Nick? I could really go for some fried chicken right now. I never want to eat chicken again as long as I live. That thing makes me want to vomit. If you have a lighter, we could try to cook a little piece of it after I kill it. That's disgusting. I'm hungry! I also love the concept of zombies talking. It's dangerous to run here! Dangerous! Pussy power! The things they say and the way they speak are just so bizarre, and from beginning to end, all I question is what they're going to say next. We're here to help you! You're gonna be fine! This relates to the story itself and how it's presented. For something like this, the performance can be just as important as the writing, if not more so. Take note, Rosenbaum. You're supposed to be a professional actor, so this time could you perhaps do it in a way like someone with half a fucking clue would do it? Let's try that. Go ahead. The game's script gets to the point where you're just looking forward to hearing what Juliet and Nick have to say about what's going on. Do you want to have babies someday, Nick? I think that's rather irrelevant, considering my situation. I don't know. We could take a skin sample and put it in a petri dish and use magic to grow a baby. Well, maybe. Cool! There's a 50% chance it will be a cannibal. Like the majority of Grasshopper's library, what stood out the most? The rogue gallery, of course. All of the dark purveyors were set pieces as the bosses for each stage, and I absolutely adored them. They're so unique and express that motif I love so much. Well, except... Lewis Legend has a special place in my heart. His appearance, absurd boss fight, design, even his voice is so incredibly badass and fitting. Ah, cocky little whore, I like that. I've got a feeling when I start playing, you're just gonna die! But that's not to say the rest don't deserve praise as well. Their personalities express both visually and vocally. Step outside the boundaries of your mind. Lose yourself in the eternal, collective unconscious, <laughs> and 
rot. Mm -hmm, I love the smell of almost dead cheerleader in the morning. Yeah! Ooh! I already told you, girlie. If you want to win your sister back, you have to play the game. And Jimmy Yuren's contributions to each of their theme songs are simply ecstatic. Seeing how each boss is based on a subgenre of rock, he would create a song that is akin to the boss's background, then mutate it with his own essence, and out the other end would be these incredible tunes. I think at this point, anyone who watches my stuff regularly knows I love me some good boss themes, and this game did not disappoint in that department. A couple departments I felt that were considerably disappointing would be the humor and the sound direction. For the most part, they both feel like they wanted to define a particular generation, but that comes with its own baggage. That My Chemical Romance wannabe is destroying San Romero! Oh, I love that song Teenager, have you heard that? The licensed music has its variations, but the most prominent direction is 80s pop. On top of that, the game just spews references whenever possible, and they're generally of that current time period or a little earlier. Now I hate you more than Carrot Top! The dialogue is trying to appeal to people that were in their 20s at the time, such as myself, as well as people in their 40s or so. My issue with this is that some of these references started to feel dated when the game came out. Never mind, six years later. Take the this Katy Perry song out of my head. Oh, what a terrible way to die! That's the problem if you're going to write humor like this. It gets old. And fast. And to be frank, most of it is not very clever. If it isn't the Pirates of the Jerk Off Ian! So among the reactions, I can't help but think the two that'll stand out are That wasn't even funny, or I don't get it. Look who it is! Mary Kate and Ashley! Stories like Killer7 and No More Heroes are extremely memorable for a lot of reasons. But one of those reasons is that they never really relied on references when it came to its humor. Therefore, their writing doesn't really age. With stuff like this, it's something that shows signs of rot right out the gate. While this isn't the only thing wrong with the game, I think it's the biggest issue and probably what turned a lot of people off from Lollipop Chainsaw early on. But it's a style of writing that people love as well, I'm sure. I think it's what made the game so divisive, besides its gauche gameplay. It's about as low brow as a story's writing can get without feeling too forced. Death Metal is for pussies. This might be one of the tougher things to explain, but I think the writing, while obviously crude, it adds an unpredictable charm that I grew up with. It's what I loved about old cartoons, it's what I love about Edgar Wright's movies, it's what I love about the original Earthworm Jim games. Not to say the game's story will blow your mind, but a lot of it does feel like they simply refused to go by the book and did their best trying to surprise the player and take it as far away as they can from the typical three-act bullshit. The mess of the writing job was very freeing to me. To be able to create this whole world, and also it's freeing because you're not stuck in a screenplay's strict moving forward plot. You're able to go in all these different directions and have fun in a lot of different ways. I loved it. I really appreciate that a man who specializes in Hollywood film writing understands that the best way to write a game script is embrace how different it is from the typical movie medium rather than attempt replicating it, perhaps to its detriment at times. To this day, Lollipop Chainsaw ended up surpassing a million copies sold and is the number one best-selling retail game Grasshopper has ever released. Good on them. It really goes to show how important marketing is. As for how players themselves took it, the game certainly found its audience. A lot of people enjoyed it as their first title by the company, although not everyone was so kind to it. Lollipop Chainsaw was a mixed bag for official sites and magazines, generally speaking, and many players, most definitely including fans of Suda51's previous games, were vitriolic towards its existence. Whether it was critiquing its clunky gameplay or the crude referential humor, some people really had it out for this title back then, and even now. I think a good chunk of it comes from a knee-jerk reaction to the game's appearance and style. 
Similar to how everyone hated Metal Gear Rising before and during its initial launch, despite being a great hack and slash title with some amazing characters, satisfying boss fights, and fantastic music. Resident Evil 6 is another great example of this, but I won't even get into that. Go ahead and smash that dislike button. Just a second. Travis, hello? Juliet's outfits sure are tantalizing. While that's all well and good, she could use some more protective outerwear. Perhaps from Sukuban NYC! Stay warm this winter and be less vulnerable to zombie chops with the animation series number one hoodie! Is that really what it's called? Don't worry Nick, we're thinking about you too! We've also got hats and beanies! Check these out and more badass streetwear through the link below! So, even though Suda had less involvement in this game, letting Masahiro Yuki and James Gunn take on the project as lead writers, I think it still bears the three essential themes to a mainline grasshopper game. Individualism, society, and death. Regarding individualism, it comes from Juliet. She's just another zombie hunter, like the rest of her family. You could say she's special because of her ability to kill zombies with relative ease and that it was her destiny to become a hunter. So how long have you been a zombie hunter? Forever. I killed my first zombie at six months old, with a sharpened rattle. But it sounds more like it was her destiny to become part of a pack, a supporter of this family business, merely following her father's and sister's footsteps. Doesn't sound like some grand destiny now, does it? Something else I think that plays on the idea of individualism is Juliet's character, not just by how she was written, but also presented. When the game was drumming up buzz before and during its launch, a lot of people cried sexism, claims that she was a blatant objectification of women with her character design. I don't entirely blame this immediate reaction, especially considering how cheerleaders are typically presented in media, but I feel most would be retracted if they take the time to experience the game and understand what really makes a character objectified. It's an early bait and switch. The way she looks, which is what the marketing was exposed to the most, is the bait. A young, busty, thin-waisted cheerleader in high school with a cute face and pleasant personality. Juliet being the bait works so well since she is many typical male fantasies crammed into one character. Hell, this bait even worked on Nick. How? how do you know how to perform a magical ritual on my decapitated head? And the switch is introduced early on. She's actually a tough as nails zombie hunter armed with a big ass chainsaw. Meanwhile, as a perfect way to top off this switch, Nick is brought down to being nothing more than an accessory due to the circumstances in the story. This switch within the story between our two main characters happens directly between the end of the prologue and the beginning of the first stage. It's too perfect of a moment to not be intentional. What the fuck? I love you too, baby! <laughs> We could be here all day if we talked about sexism in mass media and what's truly destructive to the eyes of innocent witnesses, but in regards to Juliet and how she was designed and written, look no further than the creators of the game. I think it's important people don't confuse sexuality with sexism. There is nothing in the game, ever, that makes females somehow less than males. To be honest, I think a lot of the criticisms of this game's sexism are really coming from a place where the secret message is sex is bad, sexual attraction is bad, lust is bad. I was raised Catholic. I get it. Yes, Juliet Starling is hot as hell. And yes, that probably helps to sell copies of the game. But my question is, so what? How in the world does that convey that women are less than men? It's as simple as Gunn puts it. She is never disempowered or suffers from anything by being a woman, but rather a zombie hunter. Her shortcomings and the obstacles aren't created due to their gender, just her position in the story. Juliet isn't kicked down by some authority or masculine character either. She's her own person from beginning to end with this game. If she were treated in a similar manner to Samus in Metroid Other M, the people crying sexism would absolutely have a point. Samus. Looks like I'm gonna need to ask for your cooperation on this mission, but I'm also gonna have to ask that you follow my commands. You don't move unless I say so, and you don't fire until I say so. Sam, I'm authorizing missile you! But this is not the case. On top of that, Lollipop Chainsaw actually turns the idea of objectification in video games on its proverbial head, and it was right in front of people's faces, likely without the player realizing it. Nick is objectified by Juliet. He's literally turned into an accessory, a commodity, and his humanity is denied. He is super emasculated. He starts off as this cool high school jock, and he thinks his girlfriend is this demure cheerleader, and then discovers she is a thousand times tougher, that is, more traditionally masculine, than he'll ever be. And on top of that, he loses his body and penis. Crazy, right? 
like he said, masculated and objectified beyond belief. Julia, I'm not sure I can do this, just being a head. But there's a lot of cool things about being a head. First of all, I can put you in a bag and sneak you into movies for free! Right, that hardly makes up for... Carpal tunnel syndrome? You're immune. And it's totally cool! I'm like the only girl with a decapitated head for a boyfriend. I don't want to be a fashion accessory, Juliet. This is my life! The characters even stop treating him like a person from time to time. Juliet! There's something on you! No, Cordelia! That's just my boyfriend, Nick! Oh, hey, Cordelia. Uh, how's it going? Hey, he's cute. Thanks. Ouch. The whole no body thing is cool. I wouldn't have to worry about gaining weight. <clears throat> Food would just fall out of my neck. <gasps> OMG! Then I wouldn't be as gross and fat as I am now. I don't want chewed food falling out of my neck. That's disgusting. Check it out. I gave it a makeover. I am not an it. And when Nick isn't being objectified by the women, he's talked down pretty harshly by Juliet's dad. Son, if you don't quit acting like a fruit, I'm gonna stick you in the juicer. Thinking about it, this could be a commentary to how helpless younger males feel when they're being told to man up throughout their lives when their situations and emotions make it difficult to progress in life. You seem like a fine person, but whatever dude Juliet ends up with is gonna be part of the family business. What are you gonna do? Throw magic stars at chupacabras with your tongue? I can't take this anymore, Juliet. I'm just slowing you down. Just leave me in a trash can, okay? Or a mailbox or something, because I don't want to go any further. It's something a lot of men grew up with, including myself. No complaints about that, activist? Still focused on Juliet's tits? Fine. Whatever, it's all for laughs, it's funny. And why shouldn't it be? These are fictional characters after all. Julia isn't the only example of people trying to sling mud at a piece just because it could feel problematic to someone. Still, I know I'm not the only one that sees past this junk and catches what the creators were going for. Like it or not, we are actually all objects. Our physical forms and the idealized forms of those physical forms we find in pop culture are something most of us find appealing, whether it's Juliet's butt or Batman's ripped abs. Lollipop Chainsaw is titillating, for sure. A lot of that is just because the game took an everything in the kitchen sink approach. It's utterly shameless in that regard. And there's a lot of Grindhouse and Russ Meyer in the game. A fun, floppy, over-the-top sexuality that plays out with those old forms but is self-aware of them the entire time. Russ Meyer probably doesn't sound too familiar to a lot of people watching. He's an old famous photographer most well known back then shooting for Playboy magazine. He later on directed a film known as Faster Pussycat Kill Kill, which is a fun title to say. At the surface, it was nothing more than your typical action flick, but its hook was the main cast, three lovely ladies that kicked the shit out of dudes. Or hook up with them, whatever they wanted to do with them. They're their own women. Hollywood was full of female exploitation in film around this time, but the women were pretty much never anything above worthless secondary roles slash eye candy, typically relying on one or multiple strong males to save the day. Or just fuck them. Meyer's film wanted to go against the grain and make a genuinely entertaining movie starring women first and foremost leading the helm, not just used as poster fodder. No doubt that around the time Meyer wanted to make this, higher-ups claimed that the film wouldn't do well since it stars women as action protagonists. Funny enough, Suda experienced something similar when he was fleshing out the concept of Lollipop Chainsaw. I was told that a game with a female lead wouldn't sell. I wanted to break that jinx and I also thought a new heroine was in order for the video game industry. Just like Suda to also go against the grain and prove everyone wrong, and his game turned out to be a hit. Sadly, the same cannot be said about Meyer's film in the box office, but the movie still gained a big cult following and is considered an important piece of cinema history. So, this all amounts to Juliet's own individualism. She is empowered, but not perfect. This is important to think about for the creators feel you can't be a perfect character and real at the same time. I guess she is a symbol of female empowerment in some ways, but truthfully, she's a fully developed character all to herself. She's smart about some things, dumb about others. She can be remarkably kind and remarkably self-involved. She's a cartoon, but she's also a person. She's not better or worse than anyone else in terms of who she is. I believe when characters become symbols of female empowerment, it is, in many ways, a reaction to sexism that is sexist in itself. You're still taking away a woman's humanity and replacing her with a symbol. Shopping just makes me feel better about myself. Gunn speaks his mind well. As shameless as Lollipop Chainsaw can be about... everything, he and Suda wanted to make the characters not feel so hollow and uninspired. They both understand how to make one truly stand out. 
I think people find my characters memorable because they are all flawed. Whether they aren't so smart or something else, they are more human. It makes them interesting. People don't like Ellen Ripley in Alien just because she's a woman. They like her because she's a great character that had flaws who didn't always make perfect decisions in the situations she found herself in, but was able to pull through. The same can be said about Beatrix and Kill Bill, Sarah Connor and Terminator 2, and these are some of the top examples of how to portray a female protagonist for the world of mass media. The teams behind these characters knew how to make them truly memorable. This is why I will always appreciate video game characters like Bayonetta, Heather, and Jill. Sure, they're tough, but they show signs of imperfection and sometimes need the help of others, which remind me that they can be, at times, like anyone else. Juliet is exactly the same way. That's true individualism. Still, perhaps I'm overthinking this aspect of the game. It doesn't play that big a part overall. Suda and Gun didn't solely focus on how to portray Juliet. She is merely the person, not woman. The story is centered around, after all. A tinge of individualism was also expressed through Swan. You only see him during the confrontation of the first and last dark purveyor. There's not a lot to him at first, besides an extremely stereotypical goth nerd who happens to know how to perform black magic. This world, this government, this society made my life a hell. Well, now everyone is gonna know a life of hell forever! <laughs> he just hates this town, this school, and everyone dwelling in it your typical motivation for a lame villain. This doesn't really change, but they showed a side of him that's so easy to miss near the end of the game. This school, this world, deserves to be destroyed. It rejected me. It ridiculed me. So I'll make this rotten world even more rotten. Rot away. Rot away. Rot. 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 Rot! Rot! It's kind of odd. Unlike most people in the school, you see that Juliet never bullied Swan, but she also didn't notice him, nor his fawning for her. While he had feelings for Juliet, he didn't have the courage to approach her himself. It was conveyed that Juliet was pretty popular in school, being the head of her cheerleading team and all, so Swan was just like a lot of the other men in the school eyeing her. But it appears once that door closed, it was the breaking point for Swan's character and made it his goal to sacrifice everything just for this ridiculous revenge plan against her and the town, despite the fact that she didn't do anything wrong. Why are you doing all of this? Because you're just like everyone else! You pretended to be different, but you're not! What? Me? Yes, Juliet, you! Bitch! A real incel, am I right? I guess the only thing I find interesting is that they emphasize he wasn't really that special either, despite being the main villain. For society, we got to see all the different communities of San Romero. The jocks by the field, the nerds in the arcade, the punks at the junkyard, now zombified with intent to kill anyone on sight, but still have some of their personalities intact when they were human. Let's play a game together! New game's out today! Maybe not the deepest look into society, but the shift in communities between each stage is intentional and gives us a perspective on what life was like for Juliet in this town. The memories of this place are gonna ruin the smell of cow shit for me forever. As for death, certainly one of the more blatant aspects, zombies. Besides that, the ritual could not be completed without the death of the dark purveyors and killing his business for Juliet and her family. Also, something that helped end this ordeal of massive proportions was the sacrifices from people that weren't afraid of dying once they saw it would mean the salvation of those they cared for. So, the last thing I want to discuss. I understand that Lollipop Chainsaw isn't for everyone. This kind of over-the-top ridiculousness that is its nature might not be for you. But what bothers me is how people constantly say this is completely against Suda's typical games and that he's out of ideas, lost his drive for a deep narrative, or some other nonsense. Goichi Suda is, and always will be, someone that doesn't want to be predictable with his efforts. He never wants to give the same impression with his games. This is why each main Grasshopper title is not like the previous, whether it be in gameplay or presentation. Hell, even the sequel to No More Heroes wasn't similar to the original game in regards to its narrative. And now the spin-off coming out looks even more detached from 1 and 2. What does that tell you? And even if you say this isn't a Suda51 game because of James Gunn, I understand the notion, but I think it's important to understand that the concept, gameplay, and character design still fell on Suda. He also closely worked with Gunn the whole way through. I feel like Suda and I are uh, brothers from another country. I mean, we are, 
We are very similar. I won't deny this doesn't have nearly the same amount of depth as Killer7 or even the first No More Heroes, but what I look for in Suda is his ambition to surprise the player at every turn. It's something he strides at, deep narrative or not. I doubt I'll change anyone's minds when it comes to discussing the game, but I suppose I just want detractors to see it in a slightly brighter light, or at least understand where I'm coming from. Lollipop Chainsaw isn't some generic mishmash of shit like a lot of people would like you to believe. The game oozes with charm that serves as a love letter to older western media, which inspires Suda and his work above all else. Much like Shadows of the Damned, the monotony of the game is certainly apparent, but I don't think that is enough to overcome the absurdity of its atmosphere. The characters, the zombies, the venues, the bosses, it all really managed to captivate me from beginning to end. I'm not here to convince people Lollipop Chainsaw is some hidden masterpiece, it's far from that. I just think it receives so much backlash for the wrong reasons, even to this day. Shadows of the Damned had enough identity issues, it was nice seeing Suda and his team go for something that felt a lot more original. Isn't that what we like to see from the creators we respect? Suda51 is a lunatic genius whose stories take all the right risks with humor, violence, and emotion. Coming up next, is it Suda's return to the introspective galactic symbolism from his Kill the Past days? Maybe, maybe not, but still an interesting game teeming with style. Join me next time as we discuss Killer is Dead. Thanks for watching! As always, if you'd like to talk to me and other folks about video games or food or the possibility of life outside our world, join my Discord. Big shout out to Chaseface for providing his lovely voice. If I were to suggest any video of his, it'd be his dive into the original Klonoa game. It made me feel like shit. In a good way. Big shout out to Sukuban NYC for sponsoring me once again for this video. Check out their website through the link below to get some badass streetwear you can't find anywhere else. And last but not least, a big shout out to my patrons. I adore you beautiful bastards to pieces. If you would like to support my work and possibly see previews of my upcoming videos, consider contributing to my Patreon page.